consultant and leadership support. Basically, he is helping to build and support leaders and the church, and he's got a great word for us today, so let's get to it. Amen. in Eldersburg and in Hampstead. Um, we are glad that you are, are with us today. Um, you may have heard that this is our 20th anniversary year that Crossroads started. Yeah, you can clap for that. Uh, that Crossroads started 20 years ago. And this Sunday in particular is about as close as we can figure out where the first service was actually held was, was in August uh, of 2002. And so we've been celebrating all year. We're going to continue uh, to celebrate tonight. Um, but as we started thinking about um, how we could, um, could celebrate on this day, uh, we, we wanted to, to bring a, a guest speaker who was meaningful and, and who got who we were and, and, and all of that. And, and many of you know that we are part of the North Point Network. Uh, of churches, and uh, it's it's really a selfish thing because it probably benefits me more than anybody else, because I get to meet and and talk with uh, every month um, pastors from all over the country who lead churches like ours. And Gavin Adams is one of those pastors. And when we were thinking about who would be able to share with us today, um, I thought of Gavin immediately, and, and he said he would do it. Gavin um, lives in Atlanta. He has uh, four kids and one wife, which is the way you should do that, uh, number-wise. Uh, he led, um, he was a lead pastor at Woodstock City Church uh, there for over a decade, and I am so thrilled that he's going to share with us today because he's going to talk about the one thing that we are about, which is a relationship with Jesus. It all boils down to that. And so that's what we're going to talk about. Would you give a warm Crossroads welcome to Gavin Adams? All right. Uh, man, I am excited to be here. All right. So uh, the year is 1986. Some of you are too young to remember that. If you are, just keep that junk to yourself. Um, 1986, it was a banner year in my life. Uh, Top Gun came out in 1986, the first one, uh, the, the, the good one. No, I'm just kidding. The second one was pretty good, too, uh, but the first one. I watched that movie. Uh, I mean, we had it on VHS. Some of you have no idea what that is. It was this really cool technology. You put it into a DVD, I mean, a VCR player. It had a tape on it, and then it got ruined eventually. So uh, I watched this thing probably... 50 times, 100 times that year. I mean, I knew everything about it. I wanted a motorcycle. I wanted to fly uh, for the Navy F-14 uh, Tomcats or whatever those were. I'm not a Navy person, but it was something cool like that. Um, I loved 1986, and I was, I kind of had it going on in 1986. Um, there's a picture of me here, uh, 1986. Um, <laughs> do you laugh at handsome people normally? I don't, well, that's weird. Um, you know, 1986, we were rocking striped socks that matched the shirt, right? Now, I know you're thinking, that dude is jacked at seventh grade, you know? I don't know why a guy with this skinny of arms would wear tank tops, but I did. Um, this is a summer camp. It was real hot. Now, what's unique about this picture of me in 1986 is that I had something in my life that all of my loser friends didn't have but really wanted. Any guesses? A girlfriend. That's what I had. In 19, I know you were thinking, that's one handsome bachelor. Nope, he was taken. 1986, I had a girlfriend in seventh grade. You can take that picture down, praise God. Um, <laughs> I had a girlfriend, and in seventh grade, that was a big deal. I went to North Clayton Junior High School, and if you remember seventh, I hate to take you back to middle school. There's nothing great about it, but do you remember being in middle school, junior high, and you would have maybe once or sometimes twice a year a dance Ours was the homecoming dance. It was held in the gymnasium, which was kind of fun. Uh, a lot of us, I was a basketball player. I felt pretty comfortable in the gymnasium. I never felt more uncomfortable in that gymnasium than on the dance night, right? Now, we all went. We, like, got all dressed up. We didn't have Axe body spray, but we did take showers, you know? <laughs> like, we were stoked for this event, you know? Every year, like, it was like a big deal. And we were hoping to get a girl's phone number at the dance. That was the goal. No, young people, we didn't have Snapchat or Insta or whatever. Like, you had to get a phone number, not a cell phone, a landline number, 
you would call somebody and the kitchen phone would ring and then they would drag the cord as far as it could go into their room for privacy. So we were hoping to get that one phone number at the dance and my loser friends never could, right? And I wasn't that great at it, but I mean, you saw the picture, right? So eventually I found a girlfriend and we started going together in seventh grade. Now it was ironic because we didn't go anywhere, but we were going together in seventh grade. And now the dance was coming up and man, it was like on. I was so excited. Every time I'd ever been to one of these dances, um, it always goes the same way. You remember this, all the guys stand on one side of the gym because they have no rhythm and can't dance. And then all the girls dance because somehow God, you know, bequeathed dancing to them, like have rhythm. I don't know how, but they do. Guys typically don't. So I used to be the side guy, but not this time, right? I'm so excited because here I know what's going to happen. At some point during this dance, they are going to like clear the floor and they are going to play a slow song. Take My Breath Away by Berlin. I know they're going to play it because it's 86. It's Top Gun. It's like going to happen. And I was going to have a dance partner, and I couldn't believe it. It was so exciting. So for weeks before the dance in my room, I uh, recorded that song. Again, younger people, you have no idea the trials and tribulations we went through. When that song would come on your boombox, you had to hit play and record at the same time and record it <laughs> on a tape. Again, you don't know what that is. So we had this tape, and so you would record over the old songs and the new song, and so... I, I'm, I'm, I, I tape Berlin, uh, take my breath away. I'm playing it, and I would get my pillow, and I would practice slow dancing, right? Now, I know this looks easy, but a lot can go wrong when you're first time out with a girl, you know? Because you have your hands on their hips. I mean, you just don't know. So, like, I'm practicing for weeks because I want to crush it at this dance, right? I want to get it right. So, night of the dance comes, man, I am, like, showered. I'm, like, wearing my socks with the stripes, like I'm ready. You couldn't see them because I had slacks on, but they were there. And so we go to the dance, going together with my girlfriend. We get there, and I'm like so excited, right? So sure enough, a few minutes into the dance, probably 20 minutes in, they played some like, you know, cameo word up and some other stuff like that. And then eventually the, the, the DJ says, we're going to invite all the couples out. Now, i got to be honest, like, I have, like, a bunch of kids. I have four kids now. Like, that makes me nervous, like, to even think a DJ would say that. But he did. We're going to invite all the couples out, middle school couples out, who are going together for a slow dance. And, and, and sure enough, Berlin, take my breath away, comes on. I'm like, I am so prepared, man. I've been pillow dancing like I'm ready. So I grab my girlfriend's hand. All my loser friends are just standing there. They got nobody, you know. So we walk out to the free throw line because uh, it was in the gym. We're at the free throw line, you know, and I position myself there and take my breath away and move back and forth. I'm like, I'm killing it. I'm looking over her shoulder. My friends are like, yeah, you know, and I'm like, yeah, loser, you know, and so we're going back and forth, going back and forth. And I, it's just going great, man, like a dream come true, right? And then, like, out of nowhere, I'm, I'm so unprepared, out of nowhere, uh, in the middle of the song, in the middle of a sway, she just puts her mouth on mine. And I remember thinking, uh-oh, because I practiced dancing with my pillow, but <laughs> I didn't practice this. Like, I was so ill-prepared. And, and, and I remember, gosh, I remember, like, I, 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 didn't, I couldn't breathe. I remember thinking, like, do you breathe through your nose or through your mouth? But it's hard because she's got to put something in my mouth at this point, and, like, I don't know, I don't know what's going on, right? Like, I think I blacked out, and at one point, I look at my friends. They are really losing their minds now. Like, they are so excited for me, you know? And, and I'm acting excited, you know? Meanwhile, I'm choking. There's drool. I mean, it, it is not good, you know? So the song ends. We walk off, and my friends are over here, and, and they're like, <gasps> you know, what was it like? I'm like, oh, it was awesome, you know, and all that, um, so I go home, and, and I can't sleep because all I can think about is how badly that went. Like, there is no way that's how it's supposed to be. If it is, why is everybody doing this? And I've seen <laughs> Top Gun. I saw Kelly McGillis and Tom Cruise. It did not look like that. You know, nobody made a paper airplane for me when it was over, you know. So 
I'm up all night worried. The next morning, I go to school. I'm, I'm, I'm like a little nervous, you know, almost fake sick because I didn't want to go and see her, you know, because I mean, what's she going to do? You know, I don't know, stick her face on mine or something. So I go to school, I open my locker, and there's a note in there from her, from my girlfriend, and it says, uh, hey, Gavin, um, I don't think we should go together anymore. And I got to tell you, man, it took a lot of counseling appointments before I kissed a girl again. <laughs> now, why do I tell you that story? Uh, because today we are talking about intimacy, um, but not that kind. Don't worry. Uh, we're going to talk about intimacy for a minute. Intimacy is such a fascinating topic. It's so interesting to think about intimacy. Now, just for a second, I want you to think about that word. When you hear the word intimacy, what comes to mind? Okay, what comes to mind? Now, we are in church, okay? So when you hear the word intimacy, what comes to mind? All right, you're watching online, just think about this. Any, any ideas, any words that come to mind? Nothing inappropriate. What? Yeah, closeness. Anybody else agree to that? Yeah. Honesty, yeah. Love, vulnerability, yeah. Those are great answers. I, I thought about all of these answers, and I thought, you know what? I think, and I actually put closeness. I, I think closeness is a perfect description of what actual intimacy is. Now, granted, you can't have closeness without honesty and vulnerability. I mean, all those things, right, are what help us experience closeness, which means, and I know you haven't thought of it this way probably, but it means you probably have a lot of intimate relationships in your life. Now, you don't think of it that way, right? Like you have never gone to play golf with your golf buddies, crushed a drive on the seventh hole and went, man, I just obliterated that ball. You know, I just love the intimacy that we have, boys. Like, that's weird. Like super creepy, you know, you've never said that, you know. I mean, girls, uh, uh, ladies, I, I, I don't, I have no idea what you do with your lady friends. I mean, honestly, no idea. But you go to lunch with them or shopping or, I mean, seriously, I don't know. But I mean, I have a wife, but I don't know. So, so you're with your girlfriends, though. Like, I doubt, maybe, I mean, you're, you're probably more in touch with your feelings than guys are, right? But maybe, maybe you would say this, but probably not. Like, you don't look at somebody and go, man, I feel so close to this pancake. You know, it's like we have an intimate relate. I mean, you know, it's weird, you know? But that's what intimacy is. It, it's closeness, which means we have a lot of intimate relationships in our life. And, and how do those intimate relationships happen? Well, through shared experiences. That's how intimacy grows. Again, guys, think about like your guy buddies or girls, you know, your, 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 your girlfriends, or maybe a relationship or maybe a marriage. It doesn't matter. Like, how did that relationship progress and how did it get close? My guess is shared experiences, which is why when we hear the word intimacy, we often do think about one version because that is a shared experience, Right? And it's very vulnerable and real honest, you know. But that's true of all relationships that are close. I mean, think about your closest relationships. How did they get there? It isn't just because you talked on the phone. It isn't because you texted or tweeted to each other. There were shared experiences. For instance, I, I used to play golf all the time. I had a group of guys we played all the time. We never called ourselves intimate, but we were close. And it actually was an intimate relationship. But it got there because over the course of four or five years playing lots of rounds of golf together every year, that relationship really progressed. If I think about the conversations we had the first couple of times we played versus the last few times we played, I mean, man, the conversations looked so different. Why? Well, because it was an intimate relationship. That's what happens in our lives. When we are sharing experiences, that intimacy grows. It's how it grows. And that's really what intimacy is. It's the feeling, right? Intimacy is just the feeling of being known and fully knowing someone else. That's what intimacy is, right? It's the feeling of fully knowing, but also the feeling of being fully known, which is a little terrifying. I mean, we love the idea of fully knowing someone, but it's scary to be vulnerable. It's real scary to be honest. It's scary to let your guard down and be fully known. So you know what we do instead? We, we tend to kind of let people see what we want them to see. We, we, we put masks on or costumes on, literally or figuratively, and, and we want people to like what they, we, we think they will like. So we present what we think they'll like, and they do like that fake version of us, and they 
begin to have a relationship with something, but it isn't us. It's a, a version of us. And we really want to know them, and we want to be known, but at the same time, it's scary to let the costume down, to let the mask down. I mean, we desire to be known, but we are not comfortable making ourselves known. It's real uncomfortable to do that. And this isn't like a 2022 problem. I mean, this is not a pandemic problem. This isn't a life problem. It's a humanity problem. I mean, from the very beginning, some of you have read through this, from the very beginning, God creates people. God creates one guy, a guy named Adam. At least we call him that, you know. And even if you're not sure it's 100% literal, that's okay. Like the story is still, the point is still the same. That there's a guy and God looks at the guy and says, you know what? I think you need some other people with you because you desire to be known and you desire to fully know others. In Genesis, we read that. It says that the Lord said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, now guys, that does not mean like someone to do your laundry. That is not helper, okay? Helper means somebody who can fully know you and somebody you can fully know. What's so fascinating about our humanity, and you, you know this, even if you're not a Christian, you are not a church person, not a Jesus person, like even, even without all of that, there's something in you that wants to know people. And there's something in you that wants to be known. I believe that that's just the thumbprint of God on your heart. It, God made you in his image, and he's relational. So he made you that way. And that's been something that's been with us since the beginning of time, but it's also been something that's been challenging for us since the beginning of time. Because it's scary to allow someone to fully know you. Now, we could do a whole message or series or a year on that in relationships with people, right? But, but this morning, I want to talk about that in the context of our relationship with God. Because if you think it's like scary to have a relationship with somebody else, <laughs> how much more scary is it to have one of these with God? I mean, I grew up going to church, right? I'm like a church person. Some of you are probably this way. Uh, I, I mean, listen, I've been in the church since I was negative nine months old. Like, I don't know if I was conceived there. That's super weird to even think about. But like, I am churched, okay? Like, I, I have been in church a long time. Sunday school, the whole deal, Right. So I grew up like understanding God, uh, at least uh, as a kid could. Like I grew up with this kind of understanding of who God is. And, and I wasn't really afraid of God as a kid. I mean, we would read about, you know, the awe of God, you know, the fear of God, which just means like not to be afraid of him. It just means to really um, see how glorious he is. So you're not afraid of it. You're just in awe of him. So I didn't grow up like afraid of God, but I definitely didn't grow up like thinking he was my homeboy either. You know, it wasn't like I was scared of him, but I wasn't like, you know, yo, God, you know, what's, I mean, none of, that's weird, you know, like he was this creator of the universe. He was this big, magnificent something, and, and he was distant, but not really. I mean, I, I didn't know all the details, but I knew that he was loving until maybe he wasn't. I just wasn't sure, you know, and so, you know what I did? I had a relationship with God like I think a lot of people have, even today, maybe some of you had this relationship with God. If I were to think about like how my relationship looked, it was very, very simple. It was kind of like three things would happen, right? This was my typical relationship with God. I, I would try to do the right thing so God would reward me. I would accidentally, never on purpose, by the way, I would accidentally do the wrong thing and then ask God to forgive me, and then I would just rinse and repeat. <laughs> like that was every day for me. Like every day I would try to be good because I was scared of my dad and I thought God wanted me to be good. So I would try to be good, but then every day I would accidentally not be good. And so at night, I would lay in my bed. No kidding, man. I remember so vividly. Every night, I would get in my bed. I would first look in my closet under my bed to make sure the monster wasn't there. And then I would get in my bed, lights out, and I would pray, dear God, thank you for today. You know, I, please make it stop raining. This stinks, you know, but thank you for today. Uh, dear God, please forgive me for all of my sins. Because when I was a kid, my mom would pray this prayer with me. You know, uh, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I'm like, why are we praying that with kids? You know, so, <laughs> so at night I would pray my own prayer and I would say, you know, please forgive me for, and I would start thinking and I would list all the things that I had done wrong that day. I mean, I, everything I can remember, you know, dear God, please forgive me for taking that pencil, although it is my favorite pencil. And I think they took it from me first, but whatever. Please forgive me for that. Please forgive me for punching Jimmy in the face. He deserved it, but I'm not supposed to, you know? So 
forgive me for that. You know, and I mean, the list goes on, you know, and I would list everything I can. And then at the end of the prayer, right, at the end of the prayer, I would say, and please forgive me for everything I didn't list that I forgot about. And please forgive me for everything that I did that I didn't even know I did it and I didn't know it was against you. Amen. I remember thinking, now I can die. (laughs) Because me and God are good. I just listed all the things, you know. Uh, We were good. And then the next morning I would get up and all day I would accumulate problems that were like bordering heaven and hell. It's like, I don't know what's going to happen. And then at night, please forgive me. I mean, it was just that. That was my relationship with God. Now, just for a second, does that feel relational at all to you? Like there's nothing relational about that. If you're married and your marital relationship is predicated on, I'm going to do this so that you will do this, that's not a relationship. That's a scoreboard. Scoreboards aren't relational. That might be the best marriage advice you've ever heard. I don't know. But like, I spent a lot of years of my marriage doing that. Like I mentioned, I love to play golf, you know? It's like, I'm going to do the dishes at night after dinner because then I'm going to play golf on Friday and you can't say junk about it, you know? But then you can go and buy some stuff for the house or whatever because you you like decorating the house, and I won't say anything about that. So we're just going to keep score. And as long as we're even, I mean, what a horrible relationship. That's how we tend to treat God, though. That's kind of how we think about God. You know what we do when it comes to God? We we treat him respectfully, but but just not relationally. Like we respect God. We, 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 We think highly of him, but we don't really think of him as a friend. We don't think of him as uh, a person who's close to us. This is why when Jesus showed up 2,000 years ago, it really bothered the religious people. When Jesus showed up 2,000 years ago, I mean, we know people who are very religious but not relational with it, right? We know people who still live in this kind of legalistic, you know, I'm going to do this so God will, you know, smile on me and all that, right? That's, that's not relational. That's religion, And by the way, that's how religions are built, right? God is a good God. He loves good people. If you're a bad person, look out, you know? That's how world religions are. That's how Judaism was. 2,000 years ago, the Jewish people had taken the Ten Commandments, turned them into a couple of thousand, and basically said, obey the commands and God will be pleased with you. Disobey the commands and sacrifice a pigeon or a cow or whatever, because when somebody sins, something dies. We have to pay the price. So there's this constant, like, am I okay with God emotion? And then Jesus shows up. And Jesus, like, thwarts all of that. Jesus is constantly doing things you're not supposed to do. Like, he's dressed as a rabbi, so people treat him that way. They don't know what to do with him. When you're, like, turning water into wine, you get invited to every party, by the way, right? You're, like, healing people. But then you're also, like, having pizza with prostitutes. It's like, it's blowing their minds, they don't know what to do with this guy because he seems crazy religious on one you know, moment, and in the next moment, he's doing what no religious person would be caught dead doing. You know, He's a rabbi, and he has disciples. That's real religious. All of his disciples are losers who failed out of rabbi school. That's weird. They don't know what to do with Jesus. And so Jesus is talking to his disciples one day, and we know what he's doing now on this side of it. He's helping them understand that God wants something better than religion. That's all he's trying to help them understand. And he's living that out and teaching them about it all the time. And so John, John was with Jesus during this this time of his life. John wrote an account of all the things he experienced with Jesus. And one day, John is with Jesus with all the other disciples and probably lots of other followers. And he hears Jesus begin to teach about this idea. And then Jesus prays. And later in his life, John wrote it all down for us. So here's what uh, John writes. This is from Jesus. All of this I have told you so that you will not fall away. Jesus says, I've told you all the things that I've said so far because I don't want you to lose faith. I don't want you to lose hope. Jesus continues, "They, they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. I mean, think about that. The religion had gone so strong, thou shalt not murder had turned into unless they behave like you, right? Like, because God doesn't like you. God doesn't accept you. I mean, that's, that's where this has gone, right? He continues, they will do such things because they have not known, this is a really important word, the Father or me. Now, of course, they are living in this obey 
to be in good with God world. And that Jesus doesn't say anything about obeying. He uses the word no. They, they didn't know me. That's why they are, they're doing these things to you. Later in this conversation, he says something that's such a pop- popular passage. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace, which is what we even all want today. In this world, you will have trouble. Again, you're not a church person. You can at least amen to that. I, we know that's true. In this world, there's going to be difficulty. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Not overcome the world as in nothing bad will happen to you. Overcome the world as in when trouble happens, you navigate it differently. When trouble happens, you understand it differently. You have an eternal perspective about life, not a temporal one. So it doesn't mean that he's overcome the world and it's going to be awesome. It means that he's overcome the world and you can have peace even when it isn't awesome. Then Jesus continues, and he starts to pray this incredible prayer. Um, After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven, and he prayed. And every time Jesus prays, everybody listens, because his prayers were so different than everyone else's. Father, Jesus says, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. He continues, for you granted him authority, which he used that word on purpose. It's a real religious kind of feeling word. You granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all of those you have given him. Now, look what he says next. This is incredible. Now, this is eternal life. And they thought, okay, this is perfect. We've been wanting to know what eternal life is. What are the actual rules to obey? Like, there are thousands now. Like, what's the thing? What do I have to do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, this is eternal life that you know that they know you, God. This is eternal life, that they know you. Not that they obey you, not that they do everything right, that they just know you. Relationship, not religion. It's incredible. The only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is incredible. Like, if we could put ourselves back in their sandals 2,000 years ago, right? I mean, it's incredible for us, but can you imagine growing up in a religious system where God liked the good people and was, you know, spiting the bad people, and the only way to get in good with God was to sacrifice something and never mess up again, knowing you are constantly going to mess up? Do you know why God put those rules in place for a season? to help us all understand that we'll never get it right. That's why. He didn't put the rules in place so that you could try hard. He he put the rules in place to prove that you couldn't and that you never could earn it and you don't deserve it. And he still offers it to you freely. That's why we had the rules. Now Jesus is here. He's trying to explain why they're changing. Not that they're going to go away, It doesn't mean that on the other side of Jesus, you know, thou shalt not murder doesn't matter anymore. Just kill as many people as you want. I mean, that's not the point. It's that the behavior isn't what gets you in good anymore. It's your heart. It's your faith. And it's ultimately going to be about a relationship. Here's what Jesus believed. Jesus believed that how we experience life today depends on how well we know God today. That's what Jesus believed. Jesus fully believed that our earthly experience is 100% predicated on our experience with God, how well we know God. Isn't that just fascinating? And how about this? God, God actually desires a relationship with you, not a religious experience for you. God actually wants to know you. And, And God wants you to know him. Like, God doesn't want you to walk around trying to behave your way into something. God wants you to just experience him. He wants to have a relationship with you. Let me take you back to that middle school dance for a second. As fun as that was, let me take you back. Um, It's amazing when I think back in that moment because it's very evident. It's very evident that my girlfriend wanted our relationship to go to the next level, and I was ill-prepared for that, right? Like, that's really what kind of happened. But, but have you ever experienced that? Like, not, not the, that part of it, but 
Have you ever experienced a relationship where you kind of wanted more? Have you ever been in a relationship? Actually, I have a question up there. Have you ever been in a relationship where you wanted more than the other person was willing to offer? I bet you have. I bet you can think of a relationship where you wanted more from it. You wanted to take it further in a healthy way. But the person on the other side just was unwilling, unable. Maybe they were just ill-equipped for it. I don't know. It's painful, though. It's painful to experience that. I think this is how God feels about us. I, I actually think this is exactly how God feels about us. I think God wants the relationship to go further, and we're just not ready. I think God is pursuing us so the relationship can go further, and we keep backing out. Because, you know, the reality is that God fully knows you, and that is what should terrify you. God knows everything about you. Just for a second, think about this. He knows everything. He knows about what you stole from the store when you were eight. He went to spring break with you. Like, you thought, right? Like, you thought you were going to go to Panama City Beach and God was going to stay here. I mean, you were a Christian. You even said, God, I'll be back in a week. And trust me, I'm going to be real dirty. Like, I'm going to need some cleaning up. But, but I'm going to be gone, and you're not coming with me. Like, you won't even like Panama City Beach. There's this place called Club La Vila. You would hate it. Like, you know, like, you're staying here, right? Or you went to Vegas. You're like, God, to be honest, they call it Sin City. Like, it's like, trust me. Like, you are not going to like it. It's named after what you died for. Like, don't. You're not going to like it. So I'm going to go, and I'm going to behave mostly, and then I'm going to come home, and then we'll kind of chat about it, you know, like, that's how we think. That's how we think about God, and God didn't let you go to Vegas without him. He went right with you. Everything you did didn't stay there because he was there. He, I mean, think about it. He knows everything about you, everything, everything, and he still loves you anyway. He knows everything about you. Here, go back for a second. He knows everything about you, and he still completely loves you, knowing all of that. And he desperately wants a relationship with you. God has been pursuing you your entire life, not to pay you back, but to win you back, to embrace you back, and to tell you that he loves you. That's why he's been pursuing you. That's why he's been chasing you. So the question really is not does God want a relationship with me. The question is how can we know God? That's the question. How can we know God? God's done all the hard work. He died for you. He offered forgiveness for free. You don't have to earn it. You definitely will never deserve it. He's done all the hard work. Now we just get to decide do we want to know him? That's it. So how do you do that? The good news is you do it the same way you do with people. It's so easy. Uh, uh, intimacy with God just grows through shared experiences with God. If you want to get to know who God is, all you need to do is have shared experiences with him. There's lots of ways to do that. Let me just give you four very quick ones, really quick, four things you can do. The first two are super obvious. One, read our Bible. It's incredible how we know God through reading the word of God. That's it. If you've never done, never done that before, I get it. It's intimidating. It's a giant book, little pages, little words. I mean, it's hard, right? But here's what you need to know about the Bible. It's 66 different documents. That's all it is, bound together in one thing. If you've never read it, open up to the book of John that we've been reading out of today. It is the perfect place to start. And don't feel overwhelmed. Just read like a chapter a day. It's totally fine. Like God, trust me, God, again, God is not grading you. He's not giving gold stars to more reading. Like, it doesn't work that way. Just start in John and read through it. Next thing you can do is just pray, which is, can be even weirder. Like, it's hard for some of us to engage relationally with people who we do like and like us. With God, we don't even know. It's like talking to, like, the, 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 the wall, it can feel like. But God isn't, God isn't a wall. He, he's, a, he's a person. He's listening. And he wants to have a conversation with you. So just talk to God. If you are ticked off with him, just tell him. Trust me, he's a big boy. He can take it. If you're happy, tell him. 
If you're struggling, just tell him. The purpose of prayer isn't to get something from God. The purpose of prayer is to recognize that you need God. So just pray. And then two more that aren't as obvious. Look for God in the normalcy of life. I suspect we miss God constantly because we're just not paying attention. I, I suspect God is active all the time. We're just not paying attention. If we pause long enough to pay attention, I wonder if we would experience God more. And then the last one, participate where he is active. There's a book this guy named Henry Blackaby wrote. Um, it's called Experiencing God, actually. Uh, he talked about this. It really changed the way I thought about knowing God. He said, if you want to get to know God, find out where God is active and join him there. That's it. This is why when you serve other people, you hope it helps them, but you know it helps you. Why is that? That's why. So when you serve in your local church, when you serve in the community, when you go globally and on a mission trip and serve others, I know if you've done any of these things, you know this is true. You always come back and you say, I, I hope it helped them. It changed me for sure. Like, I hope God did something for them. It has completely changed me. Why is that? It's intimacy with God. It's just participating where God is. I love the fact that a relationship with God doesn't have to be difficult. I love the fact that intimacy with God can be fully available. And if we think about it, it's actually easier than with people. Because with people, we can hide. With people, we can pretend. With, with people, we can act like we're somebody that we're not, but you can't do that with God. He knows, and he loves you anyway, and desperately wants you to know him. Let me show you one more passage just from Hebrews, and um, I love this passage because I think it so perfectly represents God's heart for a relationship with us. No matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter even what you say to him, never will he leave you, never will he forsake you. Which means never will he stop pursuing you. And never will he stop wanting intimacy with you. So how well do you know God? And what's keeping you from knowing him better? The answer is you, not him. What would it look like to experience a shared relationship with him more? I think it would change your life because I know that's done that for me. Can we pray together? Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you want a relationship with us and thank you for allowing us to have a relationship with you through your son. I mean, it's incredible that we have earned none of it. We don't deserve it. In fact, we deserve the opposite of it. Yet in your immeasurable grace and mercy, you have chosen to love us and have a relationship with us and pursue us. So God, I pray that we will just turn around and stop running from you and instead take time to know you. And God, as we know you, I pray that that intimacy will grow and change our lives and maybe even change the world. Jesus, we love you so much. We pray all of this in your name. Amen.